the NFL stands for not for long. Set Sharga and Armstead. Roll out. Walker still running out. Looks to the left. Wide open. Thompson touchdown. Colin Thompson with the touchdown. There was nobody within 20 yards. What of a catch off the bobble. Colin Thompson scoops it up. Lofting corner of the end zone. It is caught for the touchdown. The first NFL touch for Colin Thompson is a score. What's going on, everybody? Welcome back to another edition of the Colin Thompson Show, a special edition episode this week. We're talking all things Masters. Wanted to mix it up. I had a plan. We were going to go a different direction. I thought about it. I said, hey, this is the Masters. This is the best week of the year in golf. Why would we not talk about it? So we have four special guests. Before I talk about those four special guests, shout out to our friends at Not For Long Media for making this thing possible. An awesome team we have here that puts together not just my show, but several shows across our family and networks. Check out our website, notforlongmedia.com. And if you're a fan of the show and our other shows, please rate them, subscribe, set up the alerts for our YouTube. You can watch every show we do on YouTube, not just audio, but also visual. So shout out to our team that makes things go here at Not For Long Media, our wonderful hosts and team from marketing to you name it. Very blessed to have what we have going on. Okay. Lots to talk about for the Masters and perfect timing because it's sinus nastiness season, if you will, when it comes to pollen, when it comes to all the things that are going to drive you crazy is now the warm weather is here. The rain is out of the northeast. It's in the 50s, 60s, 70s this weekend. Shout out to our friends at Boron USA. Guys, our friends at Arnicare, they're our new partner of ours here, 80 five years of doing things the right way. The world leader in homeopathic medicines, uh, independent pharmaceutical laboratory that prides itself on quality manufacturing responsible for environment, environmental practice. They still operate by Boron family who started 90 years ago, continue to be passionate about their intriguing benefits of homeopathic medicines. I've tried their allergy relief stuff, guys. It's great. I talk about the pain relief creams they have. It's great. Arnicare, check them out. Listen, this is pretty cool. Boron was named one of the Newsweek's world's most trustworthy companies in healthcare and life sciences. It's a testament to who they are as a company, the people they have. Check them out. Arnicare Boron, the official sponsor of the Colin Thompson Show, and not for long media. So the Masters is here, guys. It's the best time of year uh, for golf. My question to golf is, why don't we make everything like this or even close to it? I think the resounding answer I've got when it comes to viewership and people that have been there is, you can't master what Augusta has done and what they do in the tradition behind it. And then also have the coverage that CBS has. The combination of those two are just ridiculous and amazing. And I cannot wait to take a nap on Sunday as the leading group gets to like the sixth, seventh tee. And then I can take a nap for about an hour and then wake up and they're on the back nine. And then it's must watch TV no matter what's going on. It's just really, really cool. And it's like the kickoff for summer and golf season here in the mid Atlantic in the Northeast. So a lot of fun stuff. Really special guests. I'm trying to figure out the order we're going to go in, but we're going to go in this order, I guess. Uh, we're going to start out with Artrell Foster, one of my teammates at Temple, who's big in the golf industry now, loves playing, uh, and has tons tons of insight on golf. Uh, then we're going to go to uh, Fred Dupree, my father-in-law, who played professionally, played at uh, Augusta, um, and he's a great man, a great coach. He was a coach at, uh, and a pro at Pine Valley. Um, tons of great knowledge as an All-American at LSU as well. Again, pro six, seven years. Then we're going to go to Harry Mays, who has tons of golf knowledge, has his own golf podcast. Um, and I've known from my days at Temple. He's a mainstay in Philadelphia media. Uh, sports media, and he has a podcast, Swinging and Dinging and Aggies, which is on a podcast here not for long media. And then last but certainly not least, the great Harry Donahue, who I called Temple Football Games forever. He has a golf show in the Philadelphia area called Inside Golf. He's a member at several courses. He has tremendous knowledge. They all give their picks, guys. They all give something that makes Augusta and the Masters so special, a thought or two, and they – 
uh, most importantly, give their meal for the Champions Dinner that's going to happen Tuesday night. So a lot of different stories and insight and, and fun stuff. There's, there's four people to kind of work through. I'll be brief as possible today. I don't have tons of thoughts. I'm going to keep it all the masters as March Madness is winding down. I guess my one thought on that is I think the women's game and the TV Whoever's responsible for making this decision, they missed a tremendous opportunity to put the game in some sort of prime time. Uh, three o'clock on a Sunday. I know people like to get it early and I want to get to bed early, but you don't get to bed early. You stay up, watch TV till 10, 10, 30, 11 o'clock. Anyways, put the game at seven o'clock, four o'clock out West, put the game at eight o'clock. This is the most eyeballs I would assume that have been on women's basketball in forever. It is the most talked about thing in sports right now, period, everywhere you go, sitting in a bar, someone's talking about Caitlin Clark. You're sitting in a bar, someone's talking about Don Staley or Mulkey at LSU or Reese at LSU. Or There's more uh, celebrity-type characters in the game than ever, and that drives viewership, right? They talk about that at the Masters uh, with our, the folks that joined the show today of – the eyeballs were there on golf. Now they're going, they're separated between Liv. Harry Mays talks about it. They're separated between Liv and, and the PGA. So it's hard to get viewers. Viewership's down on the PGA Tour. Viewership's not that great for Liv, obviously, either. So at the end of the day, they missed a tremendous opportunity, whoever's responsible for it, of picking when this game would be because now the women's basketball game has more eyeballs on it than ever with the star power and the coaches and how good the teams are. And there's about 10, 15 storylines with just the final four alone. So I thought they missed a tremendous opportunity. And um, I don't know if the game will have as many eyeballs on it as it ever will with all the stars leaving the game and going to the WNBA. I digress to the Masters. Can't wait for this weekend. Can't wait this weekend. Uh, I got a funny story here. I trained with a, run, a running back out of Georgia. Um, coming out of the draft, <clears throat> he's from Augusta, last name Douglas, played at Georgia. He was a second, third string running back, did some fullback stuff there for him. He was there with like all the studs, Todd Gurley, Marshall, all those guys. So he was a backup. But he told me in Augusta as a kid, and I just thought it was a cool little story to tie back into football, to make some money for people. He would be there at like four in the morning, get in line, grab people's chairs, and then sprint and run them to where they want to put their chair down at the masters. And then he would run back. And every time he'd run back, he'd make a little less money because it'd be a little bit later. Right. And the supply and demand of good seating would go away. So he'd make it whatever. Let me get out. I'll say a hundred bucks to put a chair on a, you know, the 18th green. And then he'd run back. And since there was already a group of people that already went through there, he'd run back to the, the front and say, give me 50 bucks and then 20 bucks. And he would get like th two to three runs out of it. So I thought that was a really cool story to tie back into football. A guy who ended up playing running back at Georgia was running chairs out for people. So really unique stuff there. Uh, I want to talk about my meal. I always ask them what their meal would be, but what my meal would be. I think a couple things. One, I would start out with a wedge salad. I love a good wedge salad. I would go with the jambal uh, jambalaya from Zydeco Kitchen um, down in uh, Houston, a great little restaurant there. I would go with the lamb chops. I'd offer a Wahoo dish as well. The sides, of course, would be some sort of uh, mac and cheese and maybe a uh, cream of spinach. Uh, and then for for dessert, I would offer so anything with peanut butter in it. So probably peanut butter ripple ice cream is where I would go. Um, and then beer on ice, of course. Need that. Definitely need beers on ice and some good bottles of wine. So that would be my meal uh, of choice. And then the bar of the week this week brought to you by the original Fudge Kitchen. They ship fudge and sweet, cre sweet treats across the country, fudgekitchens.com. It is the Bistro at Pelican. A wonderful, wonderful, wonderful golf course down there, right outside of Clearwater, Florida. A wonderful place. Shout out to Robert and Taylor, who took great care of me when I was in town. We went to dinner. We had drinks there. We played golf. What a fantastic place to be a member, but also play some golf. Had a great time in the Tampa, Clearwater, St. Pete area with them. And what a great place to play. Listen, this bar and this restaurant, it, there's multiple on the property, but this one in particular is great to sit down and have lunch at. It's it's right outside of the, you know, the opening tee box, the practice round, all the simulators, the, 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 you know, all the places you can warm up and get ready for your round. It's right off the water there. They, you can sit in the Adirondack chairs and watch people come up, you know, 18 and tee off on one and heckle them and make fun. And then the, all the drinks and the drinks to go and all the situation they got there is fantastic. The food was great. The TVs are huge. Uh, 
the AC's cranking in there because you know it's hot in Florida and you're sweaty and you just want to get out and play. So shout out to the Bistro at Pelican. Food and ambiance, it's a five out of five. Guys, I think there's going to be a perfect score. This place is elite elite bar to hang out and sit at with great service the five out of five the drinks were tremendous um we had some beers we had a little um we had a little margarita oh, that was fantastic and um just an overall great experience playing golf too shout out to the great caddies there as well the tvs were fantastic five out of five so perfect score 20 out of 20 pelican bistro bar of the week this week on the talent thompson show brought to you by the original fudge kitchen they ship fudge and sweet treats across the country all right guys i'm going to send it over artrell foster what was the the, the i gave artrell foster harry uh my father-in-law fred dupree Harry Mays and Harry Donahue, attorney last but not least. That's for sure. All right, guys, enjoy it. Enjoy the Masters. I cannot wait to nap on Sunday. All right, we have a former teammate of mine at Temple University, a friend, a great guy, always one of my favorite guys to compete against, to go to school with, just an all-around great dude, Artrell Foster. How you doing, buddy? Good, man. Thank you. How you doing, man? I'm doing, I'm doing great. Good. I'm doing great. It's great to have you on. We have several there's gonna be four total guests on the show this week harry mays who called okay. our games at temple uh, on the radio was the sideline guy doing the radio for all our games and i actually replaced him for a couple of years when he left harry donnie who called our games on the radio the play-by-play guy and then my father-in-law fred debris who played professionally so nice. uh, i was like man i need i need i don't need to chalk i don't need my normal guys where it's just like Right. My normal media guys. I need one of my teammates. I'm like thinking about it. I'm like, oh, Artrell, you're always posting golf videos, man. It's good to see you're getting into golf. Like, tell me about it. How'd you Absolutely. get the how'd you get the bug? Were you always into it? Did you grow up playing? I I was not always into it. So growing up, my uncle, he was really big into golf. He didn't play, but he more so watched. Um now where it came from me is my last year at Temple after I grad so I graduated three and a half years. So my yeah. last semester had to pick up some courses still to just be a student, but still be able to be a student athlete. So I'm like, all right, I'm trying to go for the NFL. I don't want to do anything hard. Let me pick up tennis and let me pick up golf. So I did, I did golf. Um, I was terrible. I never, never played baseball. So I never really swung an object objects. So I didn't know like the swing of motions. Um, so I was terrible, but I'm like, let me just keep playing. So I went down to play my friends. Cause a lot of my friends, they played in high school and from there, I'm, like, I'm so competitive. I just can't fathom losing to my friends. So I started taking it more serious and serious and say I'm a lot better now, honestly. So, I mean, and then once you're – the it's so easy to catch the bug in golf. You wouldn't believe it. That's great, man. Yeah, I know. There's something about it, right? The bug, the competitive nature. I think you said something really cool off air. That's the problem with catching up off air. You got to do it and hit record and then catch up. But <laughs> All right how it translates over from football because this is a little bit different. Like as a defensive back, there's, there's a really good kind of mantra that you talked about how it's good for golf. Yes. So I played at Temple university. I played defensive back. Um, and what I had mentioned was as a defensive back, you've got to have a short-term memory loss. So you're playing, first off, you're playing the game backwards. So it's one of the toughest positions in my opinion, um, so when you're playing that and you get a ball ca caught on you, you get scored on, you give up a crucial third down, you got to really get that out of the way. You can get mad for just a, quite a second, but the, it just goes like this. So if you keep harping on that moment, you're just going to get exposed. The rest of your game is compromised. And I think that translates translates to golf so well because <laughs> if you play golf, you know every shot is just not going to be perfect. That's just impossible. Um, so you're going to hit a ton of bad shots. You rarely hit some good ones. So it, when you hit a bad shot, but if you harp on it, it's going to mess up the rest of the round. So you got to have a short-term memory and you got to keep fighting and move on. So that's why I think my position as a DB helped me as golf and vice versa. If you golf first and then go play defensive back, <laughs> I think you'd be here really well. Tight end and golf does not mix. We were talking off there, like all these football guys are like, you're starting to see at the NFLPA, they have all these golf events now, and you're just seeing more football guys get into golf, and there's a lot of really good players. Yeah. But it's all quarterbacks. It's all kickers. Okay. It's all long snappers and punters. Yeah. You know, rarely, and my maybe a couple – I'm not saying you can't do it, but rarely you see a, 
like a position where of like physicality of good golf. It's hard right. to have finesse. It's hard. Yeah, right. You can have finesse as a football player, like, but it's hard to I mean, take like sledgehammer lifting, like they can't block power and go hit your you know, five iron or right. the ball out of hand. It's hard. Real hard. All right, Artrell, let's transition into a little uh a little discussion about the Masters because it's such a special event. Oh uh, yeah. What 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 makes it special to you? Have you been down there? Do you want to get down there? So I have not been down. I mean, that's I guess that's anybody's dream to be at the Masters. Yeah. Um, so my uncle, he like I mentioned before, how he was really big into golf. He was actually a professional chef. And he had the ability to cook at the cook at the Masters three times in a row. It was the year Bubba Watson won, then Adam Scott, then Bubba Watson. So he was cooking for the executive. He was cooking for the executives um, of Chevron. So the experiences that I know about the Masters is from him, and he just mentioned that it's just it's unbelievable. He says the one of the best parts about it is how. When you're there, you would think everything's so expensive when you're in the Masters, but they say that you, the prices have stayed the same since like 1990 or something like that, which is awesome. Um, but, I mean, that's everybody's dream to go down there, and that's why, I mean, I, I would say that you, everybody cherishes it. It's just it's one of the best majors, in my opinion. Yeah, it is. No doubt about it, man. <laughs> who, do you, who do you like? Are you watching a lot of golf? or Who, who are some oh, of the yeah. guys that you like this weekend that are trending in the right direction to have some success like that? So right now, it's just hard not to to bet on Scotty Scheffler the way he's playing, man. It's, <laughs> he's unbelievable. You get a lot of comparisons to Tiger Woods. I mean, it's so early in his career to where you can't compare him to the greatest of all time, but he has a lot of similarities with his game as Tiger. Um, he can any shot shape he can make. He off the tee, he's amazing around the green. He's unbelievable. People say he struggled with his putter, which he's has, but it's still kept him in the mix. But ever since he switched his putter to the mallet, it's so hard to beat him right now, honestly, in my opinion. So that's my favorite. But <laughs> this competition right now, I would say it's probably one of the best fields the Masters has ever seen. I love it, man. That's great. That's awesome. Uh, is there is there somebody? that you like their swing or their demeanor or their game in the professional game. That's not a big, you know, it's not Scotty. Uh, you know, it's not a Ricky Fowler, but there's someone that you watch and you're like, man, I like this guy's game. Yeah. Um, so, I mean, everybody, I would say everyone likes Rory swing. He has like the pitcher perfect swing. Yeah. But me, as I told you before, I've never swung an object before baseball, never done go. So that's not really realistic for me. So I don't strive to, be like Roy swing or whatnot. But I always tell everybody golf swing is like a basketball shot, basketball shooting form. No one has the same exact form. So you have to swing your swing. But I like Cameron Young's swing. I like his swing a lot because he just, he takes it back real slow at the top. He pauses and then he just rips through. And I think that's more relatable to my swing. I have like a slow back swing and try to rip her through. So I, I enjoy his swing a lot. All right. The most important question and, and, and uh, the final question here, I'm sure I'll think of something. We always run longer than we're supposed to, but yeah. the most important question, our trails, the champions dinner Tuesday night. Uh, when, when you win, you get to pick the meal. So if you win at the masters and you pick a meal, what do you got going on? That's a tough question. First off, I is like your, is your uncle cooking for you? He does cook for me. He does a lot of cooking. Um, so maybe he would make the he would make the meal. What what what's the meal, man? So for me, the meal. I know the main dish would be some lamb chops. I'm, mm. I love lamb chops. So I think that would be the main dish. I'm not real, not real picky when it comes to food because I eat a ton of food. But I would say lamb chops, definitely some fruit. I love fruit. Um. What else would I have? Probably some lobster, mashed potatoes. Get that in there. What for dessert? Some, some dessert. Probably some creme brulee. I like some creme brulee. Nice creme brulee. Okay. That's good. Yeah. Yeah. There's That's a lot tough, of man. I'm, I love a lot of food, man. 
Yeah, it's it's hard. We were spoiled at Temple, man. How about the oh, old days? Go go to Chow, Coach Rule. <laughs> shout out. I know, man. That lobster. No, I mean, not the lobster. Um, the lamb chops there. Unbelievable. By far. Bro, Unbelievable. Me and, and Myrick, we you know okay we it was, so this was 2015. I think our first game of the year that was the Penn State year. Now, yeah. I could be wrong here, but I think the first game of the year in 15. We did not eat Fogo. Now we beat Penn State, but I, and I think I either I'm, I could be a year off here, but I think what happened was they're like we're done with this hotel food. We're going to walk to Fogo. So the rest of the year we went to Fogo. Yeah, and and Myrick and I always sat together. I love Chris, and and we um we would uh <laughs> we would just go right. We turned the card over to red right away, no green, <laughs> and we would just yeah. go, hey listen. You have the lamb chops, sir. We'll be around with them. We'd ask the other waiter, right? Who like we who who didn't get us? We didn't ask the question to that waiter yet. It's like you bring the lamb chops out. Yeah. <laughs> I to this day, now I've had great lamb chops. Really have been blessed. Yeah. But they're my favorite ever. I think. Absolutely, I agree with that a hundred percent. Right amount of gaminess, like right around the like right amount of every. Oh, dude. Right. <laughs> What's your favorite Temple memory? Is I know this is a golf master show, but. A lot of our listeners, you know, know, and I'm constantly talking about Temple, but I mean, there's a lot of different memories for me, but which one do you want one of your favorites? Man, one of my favorites. That's, that is so tough because we have some great, great memories. I always tell my friends, like we won a championship there, which was awesome. I've never won a championship in my life. Um, but some of the best memories is leading up to the champ all the hard work that you do that's what you're going to remember more than the championship is us going from two to ten all the way to champions so yeah. there's so many memories involved in that i would say one of my favorites um i think i and i posted this last year so i had got in trouble because you know the as a student athlete coach rule didn't play with any being late to class on your phone hats so I think I was in study hall. Me and my friend was in study hall, and I had my hat on. And not thinking nothing of it, but we was in the newspaper for doing a good deed. We was in study hall. I think we were studying real hard. They put us in the newspaper. So Coach Rule, he had us up to his office. He was like, oh, man, I seen that you was in the newspaper. That's awesome, man. I'm like, yeah, we was, we was, stud- we was working real hard, Coach. He was like, that's good. That's what we expect out of you. But um, just make sure you're here at 4 a.m., because you have awareness training. I said, for what? He said, in, your, in that picture, you had your hat on in a place where we don't have hats on. I'm like, oh, my gosh. Oh. So, so we had awareness training. And you know Coach Scott takes us to the whole another level with awareness training. So he made us unrack every single bumper plate in the entire facility, stack it up on the turf, push it up. Uh, I want to say slam push it across the turf, stack them all up, unstack them, do a back. I'm telling you, that was probably one of the hardest workouts I've ever done in my life. <laughs> then after that, you know, your normal lift, then practice, then you start your day. Then you're in tough. study hall. That place yeah. made me tough, man. I thought I was tough. Um, <laughs> yeah. I thought I was this big, bad, you know, physical tight end. Nope. Yeah. Nope. I was not. I was not. I took me to a place that, I needed to go. And I think that's why we were good because absolutely all of us, yeah, all of us were willing to go places other people were not willing to go. Absolutely. And, 100%. And that's, that's for any business, any entity, any golfer. Yep. Um, now, football's a little bit different. I think physically we were willing to be able to go anywhere we weren't supposed to go. I mean, we had practice in the afternoon. We'd run. We'd lift in the morning and come back in the afternoon in the heat at three. Right just to run in the heat so we'd be conditioned right right they're my best memories though yeah i mean i always say coach rule he was one of my favorite coaches because he didn't prepare you for just football he prepared you for anything you got going on beyond football i mean in terms of time management being disciplined and just Mm -hmm. outworking yourself i mean you can apply that to whatever you want to do yeah. So, I mean, and when you learn that as a young age coming out of high school, it's unmatured. You just – and then you pick up all, all of that that you learn from Coach Rule and just uh, 
the camaraderie you get from the team. It's just you can apply that with anything you want to do. It, it, it's it's truly amazing that the stories, like you said, are fantastic. It's pretty cool. In Carolina, we had a uh, a field day our last year, the last day of OTAs. We went out as a you know as the end of this you know off season. Hey, we're going to do teams. We're going to do team compete. But they had a three point contest at the Hornets. Um, okay stadium there was bowling yeah. there's pickleball and it was all over the city of charlotte we played uh we played nine holes i believe okay. um and like just at, we all competed it was so much fun but to mention golf like it was really cool to see us get out there and it was the best day it was my best day of work ever we didn't have to do any, yeah. football, to do any football that's um, fun man yeah. you, know, you need days like that just to bring the team together i mean just have like because it's it is business, but you want to have fun with it as well. Oh, yeah. We had some fun at Temple outside those gates. I know that for a fact. Oh, absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> Artrell, thank you, my friend. I appreciate you coming on. It was great to catch up. And, uh, hey, man, this time next year, we got to have you back on the show to talk off. Absolutely, man. Hey, thank you for having me, Connor. I called you Connor. No, Colin. Not. And um, I'd like to, like to speak to you again. Hopefully, we can get out and golf one day, man. I would love to. I always see what you got going on on Instagram. I got to get out there. If we got, if I'm out west, we could do it. But if you're ever in Maryland or in, uh, you know, PA, playing South Jersey, let me know. All right, man. Hey, thank you. All right, we got the great Fred Dupree here. Not so great. He's my father-in-law. He's kind of a pain in the ass sometimes. But other than that, get uh, used to it. Yeah. <laughs> now we got the man on here. I got one of the best father-in-laws in the world, if not the best. Fred Dupree played six years pro. Was an All-American at LSU. Uh, great golfer. Great experience with uh, the Masters. Freddie D, how are we doing today? We're doing good. I'm starting out my day here with a drive, chip, and putt. Got all my Augusta gear on here, easily on. And, uh, at, you know, as I told you, I watched uh, Texas Terry just win his division. So, how about that with Dixie May doing well in her division? So, how about that? Two little Texas names. Doing well at Augusta National, starting out on a Sunday week. Right? Wow! I mean, you can't you can't beat that if you tried. That's right. You can't. No, that's great. All right, so I think right, you got drive, chip, and putt. You get the champions dinner. Like I think you know, I like all the stuff around golf. The golf to me is a part of it, but the stuff around golf I enjoy: the dining, the fun, practice rounds. Um, and I think there's a lot of history with all that at, at Augusta. Touch on like the par three contest, the drive, chip, and putt, the champions dinner, like all that stuff, what makes it kind of special and how Augusta handles it differently than everybody else. Well, the one thing we didn't uh, discuss, there was a ladies tournament that they had uh, just yesterday. <clears throat> a, uh, a Florida State uh, uh, golfer birdie three of the last four holes to, to win that, which is unheard of, but she played great. Uh, the girl she beat, she had 66 in the final round. Um, so some pretty neat action on, on the female side. It's a women's event they started four years ago, and it ends up at Augusta National on the uh, Saturday before the Masters. And uh, it's a great event, great for women, great exposure for the game. And then they brought in a, a drive, chip, and putt, which is very cool for the younger kids and their families and you know it's just like the punt passing kick when i grew up did you uh, win any did you win any of those growing up i won my local every year and <laughs> uh i only got past the next level one time and then i got bombed but what was your weakest what was your weakest one uh probably the punt yeah it's hard and uh i mean i punted but I, I, I kind of didn't do as well as I should have in that area. But anyway. <laughs> tons of bad, yeah, tons of pageantry at the Masters. All right, so let's let's dive right into it. You've been there. You've played the course. You've gone as a visitor. You've, you've played the course in competition. You've played it – I believe you have played it competition or just going for fun? Yeah, not competition. No, I okay. wish I would have played. I came close uh, in the early 80s to get into the field, but I didn't make it. I had okay. a couple of matches from the U.S. Amateur, but – Anyway. Okay. Yeah. Um, what's it like? I mean, what, what makes it so special? I've never been. Take our take our audience there. Why, why is it just so unique? Obviously, the Masters and how they put it on for TV is special. And then, but just being there, just playing the rounds, like take us through what makes it just uh, so special. 
Well, I mean, the history there is, is, is special to begin with. And so when you just enter the grounds of Augusta National and, and you go down a Magnolia Lane, is just phenomenal. You have all, all of the magnolias that, that kind of engulf the driveway. And then you just drive down that driveway and in, in the distance you see the iconic clubhouse, um, which is just phenomenal with, you know, with all the flowers that, that surround it. Um, but then when you get on the golf course, it, it's really interesting because the clubhouse, it sits at a high point on the property. And all of the sound that you hear in the bottom down by, you know, Amen Corner, number 11, 12, 13, it travels up the hill and it's all funneled in through the property. And that's from a, a fan perspective and just kind of hearing what's going on. You can always hear what's going on on the golf course. Uh, but then you have the beauty that goes along with it, too. The grass is perfect. There, there's nothing that's out of place. <clears throat> They've got, got all the perfect drainage. They've got all the, the temperature controls underground that make everything bloom at the right time, make all the grass kind of stay at the right time, drain the golf course if they get a big rain. they got the dryers underneath. It's unbelievable. It, it really is. So... Anything that you can think of or do uh, to make grass grow, to make the flowers bloom, everything in order is done right there. And they, they do it the best. I heard there's no squirrels in the property. What do they like? Shoot them off? Like got someone with a BB gun? Just like bang. Just like. <laughs> well, they pipe in the, you know, the birds all the time. You know? <laughs> this is crazy. <laughs> Which makes it a good nap time too on, on a Saturday afternoon. I can't wait. I cannot wait to nap next Sunday. Like right before, like <clears throat> right when they get to like hole eight, take a little nap and then wake yep. up for the last like six holes. I'm good with that. That's perfect. That's perfect. Uh, there's long shots. There's favorites. Who are some people that, that you like their game that matches, you know, how the course plays. Cause I know that matters too. It's not, Hey, you're a great golfer, but this course is better to certain people than others. Well, I mean, it's a big open golf course for the most part, but it really is strategically for driving too, because you have to kind of attack from the proper angles into these greens uh, to be able to get the ball close. And if you're not on that, on that edge, what gives you a proper angle, then, then you can have a difficult time getting the ball close, which means you'll be putting, you know, 30, 40, 50 feet through and around a lot of these slopes on the green. So, Driving is important, um, but with that regard, you got to get the iron shots close in the right sections of the greens. <clears throat> you can't uh, uh, miss the ball in the improper spots. Each each hole has its own little little um, interesting uh, tidbit to it, depending on where the flag stick is too. But um, in this day and age, everybody bombs it. I played in the Houston Pro-Am last week with a couple of guys who you probably haven't heard of, but they absolutely bomb it. Everybody bombs it now. Uh, to fly at 300 yards is no big deal for a lot of these young people. So with the equipment, the ball, athleticism, you know, it's it's a much different game than what I recall or know. Um, but at Augusta, too, I mean, you, you really have to understand – the angles, as I said, but also too, you better be going with your, your speed control as a putter. So that's uh, the big things there uh, that, that it, it, it takes in the whole golf game. It really does. Who are some of the people you like this week uh, in particular guys that are hot, you know, guys that are maybe not the biggest names that you think are going to play well this week? Well, I mean, the obvious thing is Scotty Shuffler. I mean, yeah, he's so good. He's, he's, he's in every category on the top of the every category. He hits it so good. He's just now starting to putt better. So, I mean, as good as he hits it, as long as he hits it, his iron game is unbelievable. If he starts putting well, I mean, it'd be a surprise for him not to win. 
I think he'll be in contention regardless. Mm. Um, it's going to be interesting to me to see some of the uh, live golfers to see how, how they translate into the Masters again after not really playing much uh, from what I can see, competitive kind of golf on some of the things they play on. And I don't know. It, it, it's not my – not not my cup of tea, but anyway, I digress. Um, but I think it'd be interesting interesting to see how John Rom does after he's kind of had some time off, um, and he's defending champion. Mm-hmm. And I think he really wants to to prove a point on this. Um, a guy like Sergio, who's an old guy, but you know, old guys can do well. At, at the Masters when they've won and experienced some good positive results. Um, I'm sure that, that Patrick Reed would like to prove everybody, you know, that, that, uh, that he's, he's, he's a worthy champion from there. Um, so those are the interesting things for me. Um, I think the sleeper for me would be, I got to look at his name to pronounce it. Ludwig, Oberg. Okay. I like it. He, he is a, a new guy on tour from about uh, almost a year ago now. He graduated from Texas Tech. Uh, I believe he's Swedish, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, but the guy is unbelievable. He won player of the year in college for two years in a row. He has an unbelievable golf swing. He didn't qualify, but he got picked to play on a European a Ryder Cup team last year, and he performed great. Golf swing, though, is beautiful. Putting strokes, beautiful. He's big, strong, athletic, knows how to win. He's my sleeper pick if you can pick him as a sleeper. I like it. Because he's so young. I like it. All right, Fred, <clears throat> the most important thing, the meal. You win the champion's dinner. You're rolling in there Tuesday night. Or you win, excuse me, and then you get to you know offer a meal to everybody. Um, what's your what's your meal? Salmon. <laughs> well, it would be, wouldn't it? Yes, uh, be nice. Yeah. No, it would not be. <laughs> um, I think I think really I, I, again I like Scotty's meal uh, for, for most part. You know, I, I like Scotty's meal that he had last year, um, with the standpoint of he had some some sliders to start with <laughs> with a little, uh, you know, queso mm. on the side. Then you, then you could throw in for, for the main meal. I definitely want a salad. You know that I got to have salad, oh, but I got to have like a, um, a ribeye with a little side dish of crawfish enchiladas. Mm. Okay. Um, and then we may kind of throw in, um, a little, little, uh, uh, corn on the side, but, but the best thing, and I know you'll like this cause I know you've had this is my wife's, uh, chocolate flat cake she with a little ice cream on the side. Oh man. So I think that, I think that would be my, my dinner. Is that, is that okay? Is that, is that okay with you? And what would you be, <laughs> what would you be drinking? What would you be drinking? Well, you know, I've got a tournament to play the next day, so I couldn't uh, wait that much. But if I were just one of the old guys, you know, which you are, wasn't playing the next day, maybe I'd have a little, a little uh, Glen Limit, potentially a little red wine, you know, to go along with the steak. <laughs> maybe a little bit of both. Everything. Yeah, yeah, uh, maybe a little bit of both. A bottle. Um, of beer. <clears throat> lastly, here your favorite, um, your favorite hole that you played there that you just said this is so cool that blew you away. Hmm. Good question. Every hole is unique. Um, it really is. But I think the funnest hole out there is 15. Par five. You kind of have to hit it up the right-hand side to kind of get an angle into the green. It's a green about as big as this phone that I'm talking <laughs> into right now. Um, it's not very deep. You got to carry water. Uh, you got to be very precise. If you're not precise, you're either in the front water or you're potentially behind the green with a very difficult chip back to the green. Or if you really made a mistake, you'd be in the water behind the green as well. But it's unique. Uh, You can make a three there just as easy as you can make a seven. 
And uh, I think that's what's really cool about the Masters is, is those things can happen as you kind of enter the back nine with, you know, uh, 12, the par three with a little little green there. Uh, 13, eagle potential. 14, depending on where the flag is, could be a potential uh, birdie. Uh, and then 15, as we're talking about, uh, 16, and then the hard finish, the last two holes. But, yeah, I'd say 15 is most interesting and kind of the biggest swing potential. There it is. Insider knowledge from our golf insider here at Not For Long Media, Fred Dupree. Thanks for coming on the show, man. <laughs> well, thank you, Colin. Hopefully uh, you, you you get a rating out of this somehow along the way with an old guy. <laughs> yeah, you're old, a rating. What does that even mean? All right, Freddie. Thanks, brother. All right. Harry Mays in the building. Uh, he's been a mentor. He's a friend. Someone we work together. And uh, someone who's got extensive golf knowledge. <laughs> he's on multiple golf shows. Uh, plays a ton of golf. H. Mays, how we doing? I'm doing great. I'm glad you said that I have extensive golf knowledge because I don't have extensive golf ability. <laughs> Let's just make that very clear. I What's can talk handicap, again. Harry? What's that? What's your, what's your handicap, Harry? I'm carding like a 15 index right now. Okay. Yeah. So I bring some strokes to the party. There you go. We, yeah. we, we, we need folks like swing it and ding it. Check out Harry's show. It's a great little golf show. And then Ah G's pod hanging out at our not for long media family networks We've been doing radio in Philly forever. Um, Har, the Masters, uh, have several guests on the show. Everyone's give a completely different answer, which is awesome. But what does the Masters mean to you? And have you ever been there? I have been there. Uh, I was there once. I was lucky enough to, when I lived down in North Carolina, uh, to sign up for a, a road trip, a bus trip from Research Triangle Park, which was right near where I lived. Me and a buddy got up at like three in the morning, got on a bus and were taken down there with about, I don't know, 80 other people. And pulled up at the gate near the uh, near the sixth tee, and had the most wonderful experience, you know, up until then on a golf course. It's just a magical place, and as soon as you walk on the grounds, you realize it, you feel it, and it's just something. It's it's something with such great tradition and uh, and history that that's what makes it special, and the golf course makes it special. It's it's just an unbelievable piece of land you could literally you know eat breakfast off of the fairway the place is that clean it's immaculate and that's the that's the word that i use to describe it is absolutely immaculate not a piece of pine straw is out of place on that property and it's something to behold i it's a bucket list item i think for any sports fan to try to get there at least for a practice round which is what i did those are typically you know the the days when the when the players are most relaxed and you can sort of have a little bit more fun because it's not as, you know, it's not serious golf. They're just out there, you know, practicing and betting amongst themselves and, you know, <laughs> figuring out what they're going to do, uh, you know, with this pin position on, on 16, you know? So th those are the days that I think are the most fun. I, I try to go every year. I, I sign up on the, on the website to get in the lottery for tickets. And, and then I get that declination notice in my email sorry try again next year but uh we'll try to get down there again but it's a, it's a terrific place i was there and i think it was 1994 was the year i went and jose maria olafable ended up winning it uh one of his two wins uh at the masters and we got the 88th masters coming up this week and uh lots of great storylines um you know we got a couple of great golfers that are coming in really hot. Uh, we talked about Scotty Scheffler before the show began, and it all begins and, and, and starts with him. And then you got all these live guys from the live tour, yeah, including the defending champion, John Rahm, and a couple of guys that have actually won a couple of green jackets that are now on the live tour, which are really a wild card uh, when it comes to these major championships, because uh, you know, you can look at the odds and, and, and you know, and DraftKings has uh, John Rahm at, uh, what is he right now? He's like the second or third favorite, I believe, on mm -hmm. DraftKings. Yeah, behind Scotty. Yeah, he's uh, he's actually third favorite at plus 1,200. Scotty Scheffler's plus 400. And then you got Rory McIlroy in there at plus 1,000. But, you know, Rahm is bringing a defending green jacket. And I'll tell you, these live guys are very motivated because another win at, at a major, you know, they had Brooks Kepka last year winning the PGA. John Rahm won the Masters before he went to live. But that was a big reason why he went there, because now he knows he's in uh, for the rest of his life. 
he could play at Augusta National, regardless of what tour he's on and what world ranking points he does or doesn't get. But these guys are coming in loaded. And there's a guy named Joaquin Neiman that is probably playing the best golf of anybody on that tour right now. And he was T-16 last year. He's only played in, I think, three or four Masters. He was there as an amateur uh, a couple of years back because he won the Latino America Amateur Tournament. And that person automatically gets a, a spot in the Masters. But he's plus 2,500. There's still some juicy, some juicy value to his number. Or, and to his name, and he's bringing in uh, quite a quite a game and quite a game for this venue. Got He favors a guy that can hit a really high ball with his irons and drop it right into these pin positions because there's only, you know, the, the greens might be big in size, but the targets within the greens are very small. And if you miss those targets, you've got you've got some uh, you know incredible two putt opportunities at Augusta National. Two things, Harry. First. Uh, <clears throat> Your thoughts on live? I know that's a major question, but just like your, your bullet point thoughts on it, why it's good for the game, why it's bad for the game. Well, I think it's bad for the game because it's divided the game. And and now all we're really talking about is, you know, who's the next player to to leave the PGA Tour and go to live? And how much money is X player going to be guaranteed? And, and it's, it's it has become now a discussion about money. And I think that turns a lot of people off. A lot of viewers, you know, viewership is down on the PGA Tour. The, the ratings are not as good. And it's because some of these players are no longer on the tour. I get that. But they're not really going over to, to the CW to watch them play in, in shorts uh, with, with music playing on live either. So, I, you know, I think it's taking people away from the game of golf as far as, you know, the professional game, which is a shame. And it's just it makes what's happening this week even more special because now you get to see those players play against the best of the PGA tour players. And all really, we really want to do as golf fans is see the best players play in meaningful tournaments. You know, the, if you won the live Miami event yesterday and you're uh, Dean Burmaster from South Africa, that's good. Good for you, but nobody cares. Uh, seriously, no, there's no tradition. There's no value to, in my view of any of those those tournaments, those guys are making a lot of money, and God bless them. I don't begrudge them the money, uh, but it's a shame because I'd rather see, you know, John Rahm, Cam Smith, Dustin Johnson, Brooks Kepka, Joaquin Neiman. I'd rather see those guys go head to head with Rory McIlroy and Scotty Scheffler. You know, every every big tournament on the PGA Tour. That that to me means a hell of a lot more. We don't talk a lot of gambling on my show. Uh, it will probably want to transition from my career being over. It's just not a coy thing to talk about when you're a player, right. but explain gambling and golf advice you could give to people. Like I I've here on some of the hockey shows I listen to, they dabble in some golf too. They're like, yeah, I take a, somebody on a Sunday. I I'll bet, you know, a back nine for somebody because mm -hmm. taking someone before, like you don't know what could happen in those four rounds, right? It could right. be an absolute mess. So your advice is someone who's looking to gamble this weekend on the masters. Well, yeah. And a lot of it depends on the draw. Like uh, last week, for example, I had Billy Horschel in a one and done pool. Uh, maybe he was my selection for the Valero Texas Open and his tee times were early on Thursday and late on Friday. They all oh, they flip flop. them, OK, and you're at the mercy of the weather. Uh, it's an outdoor game. It's always going to be an outdoor game. I know everybody's playing in simulators, but this is an outdoor game when you're betting on this stuff. And he got the most of the wind on Thursday morning and Friday afternoon. So he had the bad tee time, missed the cut by two or three shots. And, uh, you know, that's that's what happens. So one, one thing, you got to look at the weather. You got to be a weatherman if you're going to bet golf and try to get a handle on that. Um, the, the thing I like to do, because you're not betting against the entire field, is I love matchups. They have what they call matchups. You can take a matchup on a on a certain day, one player versus another player. And he only has to beat that one guy, um, you know, or matchups for the whole tournament, all four rounds, you know, one guy versus another guy. So. You know, for example, you might take, I don't know, Rory McIlroy matched up against uh, uh, Cam Smith and maybe Rory McIlroy is a minus 130 favorite. You know, so you got to lay 100, 130 to win 100 on Rory, but he only has to beat Cam Smith. And if Cam Smith misses the cut and Rory makes the cut, you're automatically you're automatically a winner. So the yeah. matchups are really cool. I like top 20 bets. Uh, the value isn't uh, you know nearly as good, obviously, but, it, you know. With, there's a lot of ties in golf, okay, where guys, you know, have, you'll have five guys tied for second place. Well, that, you know, they, they take all the second, third, fourth, fifth, and sixth, add the money together, and then split it. 
So then the next guy is like, you know, he's seventh. So you can find your way out of a top 20 pretty quickly with all the ties. So it's, 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 it's gambling for a reason, but I like top twenties and I like matchup bets. There it is. And, all long, right, sh- and long shots. They're always fun. Oh yeah, long shot. Of yeah. course, then you can pump your chest out. Even if you yeah. didn't make the money, at least they somewhere got near the top ten. Right. You're saying, there's I been a lot of long shot winners on the PGA Tour thus far this year. It's been the majority of long shots. The big name guys outside of Scotty Scheffler really has haven't haven't shown up. I mean, I, I kind of like I don't know. I'm a lefty, so I, I like Phil. I want to see Phil. Phil was what second last year, tied for second. Phil was T two last year. He's got 16 top 10s in his career at this golf course, including the three wins. You mentioned he was T2 last year. He's plus 18,000, so 180 to 1 on a guy who knows every inch of that place. And there's this is part of the magic of Augusta National. Certain guys, when they enter that property, magical things happen, and he's one of those guys. Jordan Spieth is another guy who can all of us, these guys can all of a sudden find their game at Augusta National because they've had tremendous success in the past. Jordan drew me in to golf then when he was like He's under great. Arm, when, at that time like was yeah. like I was in college I was like I'm all in he, he got me into watching golf. 2015 he, right around he, that he had an incredible 2015 2016 2017 those two three years is when he won all his majors and uh was he was the king of the world then. Yeah he was yeah. I, I like his demeanor personality. All right Harry. Oh yeah. Your picks uh, for the weekend, who do you like? Well, I mentioned Neiman. He's a guy that I would take a bite out of at plus 2,500 just because he's a guy on live that I know is really playing well. Um, another guy that is a guy that plays really well there coming from live is Cameron Smith. He's got four top tens at Augusta National. Last year he was T34, but he's plus 3,000. And, you know, he almost he got very close the year Scotty Scheffler won it. Remember, there was those two guys teeing off together on the on the, the uh, final day. And uh, about the third hole, Scotty chipped in for a birdie. And Cam Smith, I think, made a bogey. And the whole tournament turned on a dime. And Scotty went on to win. And Cam Smith went on to finish T3. But he's a guy who's a tremendous putter. And that always helps you in golf. Xander Schauffele is a guy who's playing really good golf right now. He has a hard time closing. He doesn't have that many wins to his resume, but this year alone, six top tens on the PGA Tour, including a T2 at the players, losing to Scotty Scheffler. And he's got three top tens at Augusta National, including a T10 last year. Uh, So watch out for him. Uh, Everybody likes Rory McIlroy because they want to see him win it. He's the media darling. I don't seem to get it. Uh, but he's got seven top tens in it at Augusta, including uh, uh, you know some very close calls. He mi- he missed a cut last year, uh, but was T two the year before with Colin Morikawa. But he's got five top twenty fives thus far in twenty twenty four on the PGA Tour, including a third, a distant third on on this past week at Valera. But not playing the greatest of golf coming in. Um, looking to find, in fact, he met, met with Butch Harmon, one of the uh, vaunted golf instructors a a week or so ago to try to find something in his game. Hideki Matsuyama is a guy who has won here just a few years ago. He's got three top tens, including a win, and it was T16 last season. And thus far on the PGA Tour, he's got, in his last four starts, a win on a very tough golf course at Riviera, a T12, a T6, and a T7. So he's playing really well and has won here. Look out for him. And as far as long shots, I mean, Adam Scott has won here before. And he's he's way down the board, I noticed. Let me see if I can get the latest number on him. Um, Adam Scott is 90 to 1. So plus 9,000 on DraftKings. There you go. That's a guy that I, that I would look at. Um, now, are you going to sprinkle all this, Harry, or are you just going to pick your one or two? Oh, I'll do some sprinkling. There's yeah, no yeah. question about it. <laughs> Dustin Johnson, too, is plus 4,000. So he's 40 to 1. Now, he won here back in the in the pandemic year when they played it in the in November. Totally different golf course. Totally different situation. But he won it against a stack field. Um, and he has uh, apparently rededicated himself this season. Uh, you know, he took the money from Liv and he's kind of, you know, sort of living large and just not really <laughs> focusing so much on the on the results. Kind of Jupiter golf. hanging out with. Oh, uh, yeah. Uh, it's really, really tough to have a good father in law and his wife. And yeah, 
<laughs> yeah, playing a, real- a lot of playing a lot of uh, matchups or uh, matches with Wayne Gretzky, I'm sure. Yeah, but he's dedicated himself. So watch out for him. Harry, you know what happened that day? What's that? At Master Sunday. My first NFL touchdown. Oh, is that right? This catch right here behind me. So, and the reason why I remember this is this. And with Minnesota? No, no. Was it? it was with Carolina. Carolina, okay. We played the box and Brady. And there's no one in the stands. And right. um, reason, right, COVID. But here's why I remember it. Because all the games were on Fox that day. Every single game. So, because CBS had the Masters. Masters. Yeah. So, when I scored, I was the first touchdown of the day or second. So, everyone that was watching the Eagles games, the break-in, oh, we got a first touchdown here for the Bucks game. Let's go to Carolina. Some guy we don't know or who the hell this dude is who scored for us. <laughs> Some guy took me, Harry, to score a touchdown that day. Is that right? Yeah. And I think I met him, like, boozed up down the shore somewhere, and I forget. Mm-hmm. Like, I forget the guy. But – Long story short, it's the, trust me, uh, it's definitely not about me, but I, I remember that day I'll never forget, obviously. Oh, and, of uh, course. It was, Ma- it was Master Sunday. So, all right, Harry, my favorite part of the program, Champions Dinner. Mm-hmm. It's always you, this freaking thumbs up thing keeps happening. I hate it. But Champions Dinner, um, I've heard of great answers, but what's your what's your meal of choice? You know, I'm kind of boring when it comes to food, to be honest with you. Um you know, give me some red meat. Give me a nice, uh, you know, filet mignon or a New York strip. You know, baked potatoes. That that kind of thing. I'm I'm a meat and potato guy. I'm kind of boring. I'm American. I don't have a I don't have a great palate for anything. You know, out of this world. Like I looked at the menu that John Rahm had for this year, and he had all this tapas stuff. You know, because he's from Spain, obviously. And the, I love how the guys that win, that are international guys, you know, keep it true to their homeland in a lot of ways. And I think that's really cool. But they've got the most unbelievable wine collection in the wine cellar below the below the clubhouse. That that's where I would really do some homework as to what they have and what I would pair with my, you know, maybe some nice ahi tuna appetizer paired with you know a certain wine. Or I would go to work on that. But I'm pretty much pretty much red meat, baked potatoes, and a nice dessert and a lot of wine. The meal would happen in the wine cellar. <laughs> yes, exactly. It would more or less be drinking wine, you know, with with a meal. It's like more about the, the clubhouse and some wine. <laughs> exactly. Oh, <laughs> uh, Harry, any plans to watch in, in any certain places this weekend? You're going to try to play some golf and then watch after. What's your What's your plan to? Yeah, I, I plan in the morning. I got well, I got a ten fifty on Saturday at the nineteen twelve club with three other guys, and uh, that'll put us. You know, we'll be done by two before two. So. Uh, I'll be able to nestle in for Saturday, but Sunday, it's it's all it's all Masters. They they say the tournament doesn't begin until they they hit the tenth tee, you know, for the back nine. But you don't call it the back nine at Augusta National. It's like the inward nine or the closing nine. You can't say back nine. It's against you know they don't like that club policy. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, lastly, sorry, I know we always run wrong. It's how it goes. All right, uh, I asked Harry Downey this. Your your yeah. favorite courses to play in the Philadelphia area, South Jersey, Tri State area. Great courses, no secret. One of the best golfing areas in the world, in the country. Yeah. Uh, your favorite places to play? Well, I've I've had the good fortune of being able to play Pine Valley twice. So obviously that goes without saying. Uh, I've never played Marion, but I'd love to. And I've played the Cricket Club, which is fantastic. The Wissahickon course, all the history there. It's just a, a wonderful property and great people. Uh, Rolling Green is one of my favorites too in Springfield, Delaware County. Uh, that's a a, a Flynn design, and and I play, you know, I play at the 1912 Club, and they've done some tremendous things over there. Is you know bringing that golf course back, getting rid of trees, and and uh, redoing a lot of the bunkering and and stuff. They've really uh, really made it uh, a beautiful place. And I also play at Lulu, which is uh, you know a Donald Ross classic. Uh, mm-hmm. we, you mentioned it, though. We got such tremendous, you know, yeah. availability. It's like an embarrassment of riches. We refer to it as on the uh, Swing It and Ding It podcast because it truly is. A little gem as we like to wrap up here. I, I like Look Away. Up in oh, yeah. I've, I've been up there once. That's a great spot up in Bucks County. Yeah, Dole's yeah. right where I'm from. So, all right, Howard. Thanks, man. Enjoy. You got it. Have a great one. All right. I'm with the legendary great friend. <laughs> uh mentor we've had so many good times together in in the booth hanging out on the road 
the great Harry Donahue. How you doing, buddy? I am doing fine. Thank you again. How much do I owe you now for those <laughs> introductions? I mean, I know we started off, it was just uh, a, a couple Diet Cokes and a hamburger. Now it's probably into cash, right? Oh, you're the best. I cherish our friendship. <laughs> I cherish our memories of, uh, you know, hotel bars at ECU, chatting yeah, away. Who cares what you talk about? <laughs> uh, In the booth, down on the sidelines, Colin Thompson, folks. There he is, yes. Talking Just Temple a... football. In better days, I may add. In yes. better, better days. Better days. But we are not here to talk about that. We're here to talk about Masters. We're having several people on the show. Um, Har. There were some great things you brought up that I think are interesting before. Now, we're recording this on a Sunday. This is going to come out Tuesday before the Masters. Uh, First off, Tiger, whether he's going to play or not, right? You've talked about it. You're going to get into it. But for me, what makes people great is practice. And when you have injuries like that, you cannot practice the way that – what it takes to play at that level. I know he's got some injuries and you have some thoughts on it. Yeah, right. I've had uh, multiple surgeries on my foot. My right ankle is replaced. Uh, now I'm older than Tiger, and I never had the game that he had. But I think, you know, when you t- can take into consideration everything he's been through the last few years, plus his age. I mean, he's not, you know, 27. He's like 47 or 48, whatever. Yeah. Uh, if he was as healthy as anybody, he'd have a tough time winning uh, today uh, or this week, I mean, in terms of the competition and his age and now coupled with the injuries. Uh, yeah, that, and that golf course. I mean, it's it's hilly, very hilly. And as you know, that's the worst thing for somebody in his condition. So, you know, hey, it was a great run. His legacy will is almost unmatched. And uh, but let's let's move on. It's it's time to move on. Yeah. One of the most dominant athletes, not just golfers. Sure. Of all time. What a great story. Um, Har, you mentioned the course. You've been there several times. Some stories, some moments, some some. Something that you could give us where you're like, man, the first time I was here, uh, it blew me away. Uh, Something about that place is really special. There's no place like it. I've never been, but I hear amazing things about it, and it's so much fun to watch on TV. It is. It is. It's really the beginning for people in my neck of the woods up here in the northeast of the Philadelphia area. It's the beginning of the golf season, Uh, even though, you know, the PGA Tour starts in January. uh, This, for us, is uh, really the, the kickoff of event, the first major and, you know, it's the history. It's uh, the golf course. Uh, yeah, my first time, I've been there six times. Uh, never played, but I've been there to watch competition. I saw Arnold Palmer's final nine holes in person at Augusta National. Now, that you talk about legends, okay? Arnold, what, uh, four-time winner? And uh, that 18th hole, he hit driver, driver, and came up short of making it onto the green. I think he made a five. That was his final hole in master's competition. And there wasn't a dry eye on the golf course for those uh, last shots at number 18. But, uh, you know, everybody talks about, you know how it is, Colin, when you watch an event on television, any sport, whether it's, you know, Madison Square Garden in basketball or Yankee Stadium in baseball, you know, you have an idea before you even go there in person what it's like, but it still blows you away. And that's the same feeling you get for anybody at Augusta National. The main thing you notice is you knew it was hilly in certain parts of the golf course, but n- never in your imagination did you think the topography was as severe as it is when you're there in person. So that, that's the biggest impact I have. Plus, it's like Disney World for adults. You know, at Disney World, you, you never see litter or anything on the ground. So you don't even see a dandelion or a weed on the golf course. At a, I don't know how they keep it in such pristine condition, no matter where you are. Forget about fairways and greens. I mean, you know, you can be away from a fairway by 100 yards uh, on your way around the golf course, and you look down, it's, it's picture perfect. So hats off and to the Augusta, Augusta superintendent, the golf crew, the people that make all that happen. It's one of kind when it comes to playing or watching an event like that at Augusta National. There's nothing to compare with it, I don't think, in sports. I know I'm a golf fan, you know, and non-golf fans will say, oh, you know, you're one of these guys, you know, that live in a bubble with golf. Oh, it's true, I do. But I also get around, as you know, mm-hmm. uh, to major events, whether it's a Super Bowl or a World Series or a Stanley Cup event. And uh, there's nothing like it for somebody like me. And I just marvel every year. 
it keeps getting better. And what they've done too, to enhance like the women's game, you know, they recently had the uh, women's amateur where the best amateur golfers uh, you know, among young women get a chance to play there. I mean, think about that. They don't do that for men. They do it just for women. And they're at the, they're, they're at the tip of the spear, I think, when it comes to decision-making and growing the game of golf. I mean, know the PGA Tour and the PGA of America try to say that all the time. But I think when you really slow it down and look at what those institutions have done and what Augusta National has done, Augusta National doesn't have to take a back seat to anybody in the game of golf. What a, what a special place and what, what great memories and what great stories. And All it's right. cheap. And when yeah. I say cheap, I mean, you know, you can get a sandwich for like uh, two bucks, a soda <laughs> for, for a dollar and a quarter or something like Which that. Which is brilliant because <laughs> – Every year it becomes a story, right? That becomes a headline and it's such a fun headline because everybody can relate to that of going to an event and spending a hundred dollars yeah. just to feed yourself, you know, right. and park it, your car, park your car. <laughs> and they, no phones, no affordable, phones. crazy affordable, beyond affordable food. And the other and, thing that this has been seen in any event, the golf or any type of sport, you show up with a chair and you put it down, say at the uh, amen corner. You know, like 11 green, tee shot on 12, the iconic par three. And you want to get up and walk around and see some other golf, come back two hours. Nobody is sitting in your seat. They haven't, like, kicked it to the side and put theirs. They're not, not, not allowed to do it's that. That's South Philly. And, and they don't have, like, security. It's like the honor system. People know that, you know, if somebody's chair is there, yeah, it's like putting your chair out to get a parking space on a snowy day. Nobody can touch it. OK, where else is that done in the world in anything, let alone sporting events? Right. Huh? There's no 700 level at Augusta <laughs> National. <laughs> and for Philly people, we know what we're talking about. Yes, <laughs> yes, we do. Yes, we do. All right. Let's, let's let's get to the golf part. Uh, you know, some underdogs, if you will, some people that you know may not be talking about that you like that you think is going to have success. Uh, this I had to put my in. specs on here just to look at my notes, if you don't mind. I love it. They look fantastic. Do I? Great. Uh, well, let, well, first of all, let's talk about the field. In term, this is one of the four majors in golf. But there's approximately 90 players. There's 20 different ways you can qualify for this event. And there are several amateurs. There's probably maybe a dozen amateurs. Nothing against amateur golf, but for most of these guys, it's the first time, maybe the only time they'll play at Augusta National. And uh, they got no shot. That's not going to – there have only been two first-time winners – but I say first time, first appearance in the in the tournament to win. That was the first year they had it back in 1934. Obviously, somebody had to get that distinction. And then Fuzzy Zeller, he won the first time he played in the event back in the 70s. But it's it's very difficult for first time winners to uh, compete, let alone win. And then you have like they have previous winners. There's probably a dozen of those guys. Now, some of them are young guys, obviously, the defending champion or somebody like Scotty Scheffler, who is defending champ. John Rahm's the defending champion. Scotty won two years ago. I mean, they're going to be in the hunt, okay? But then there's other guys like Freddie Couples. Freddie won back in the 90s, I think, early 90s. He, he's got no chance. But they invite him back. They do have a cutoff. I think it's now 65, where they used to let you play. If you like Sam Snead probably teed off when he was 78 years old or something like that. There's no way a previous winner over the age of, uh, say, 35 has a chance to win this tournament. So there, roughly, I'm going to say 20 percent of the field has no chance to win. But that's OK. That's part of the tradition, the legacy of Augusta. Who are some long shots, maybe? And, you know, I hate to say these guys are long shots because these are great players. Maybe they haven't won at Augusta, but and maybe they're not in the conversation all the time. But a, a kid like Victor Hovland, this is his fifth time playing at Augusta. He was a low amateur the, when he played as an amateur. So he's played in four previous events as a professional. Uh, put him on your list of, uh, you know, guys that maybe a lot of people aren't talking about. How about somebody like Shane Lowry from Ireland? Ninth time he's played. His best finish was a tie for third in 2022. He's a major winner. He won the British Open uh, a few years ago. Uh, he may not be in the conversation right off the top of your head. Keep an eye on Shane Lowry. Max Homa, fifth appearance, uh, four top 20s out of the uh, four appearances he's made prior to this year. Uh, his best finish was a tie for 43rd, I think, uh, 
last year, but he's a kid that's getting better every time he goes out on the golf course. Max Homa. And here's one for, for old time's sake. And, and this, this like, like I said at the beginning, you know, when I say a long shot, how about Phil Mickelson? Last year, he finished tied for second. He had a 65 in the final round. That is the lowest round and the highest finish by anybody in Augusta history, 50 and over. Now, there aren't many guys 50 and over that play. But if, if you're looking for somebody, a real long shot, Phil Mickelson. Now, in terms of uh, favorites, you got the defending champion, uh, John Rahm. Uh, mm-hmm. Made a lot of news earlier when he went to live this year. John Rahm and Scotty Scheffler, I think, are the two prohibitive favorites in this event. Uh, John is uh, in his eighth time. It's hard to believe John Rahm now will be playing in eight Augusta National Championships. Scotty Scheffler, he's already won what? Back-to-back tournaments this year. He won the Palmer Invitational. He won the Players' Championship. Made a run in the last time he played two weeks ago. Uh, I would say if you're looking for two, you know, flat-out chalk players for this event, it's got to be John Rahm and Scotty Scheffler. And the list of other, like Dustin Johnson could be on the list of outliers. You know, he he has the record for uh, 20 under par in the 2020 Augusta National when he won. I mean, 20 under par. Think of the guys that won. But he, of everybody, in the almost 100-year history of the Masters, he has the lowest score ever. How many guys? That could win you a few beers on a trivia night at some bar in Annapolis. or Well, thank you, Harry. You're helping all of our listeners earn some free beers, and you're helping me earn some free beers (laughs) that I may have to take up today when I ask somebody. There Um, you go. Who has the lowest round in the history? Four, four, four rounds, lowest score, and that would be Dustin Johnson. Dustin Johnson. Um, Har, real quick, have yeah. you have you called a golf match before on TV? Uh, yeah, I have. Uh, my first one was that you, you probably know where this golf course is, uh, Spring Mill in Holland, yeah. Pennsylvania. It used to yeah. be called High Point well yep. before you were born, and a lot of our, your viewers here on the podcast were born. Back in uh, the early 80s, when Comcast was just beginning in the Philadelphia area, I was on the 18th Tower at uh, then High Point, now Spring Mill Golf Club, for the Delaware Valley Open. (laughs) And uh, my analyst was a fellow by the name of Tom Smith, who was the pro. And the event, we had a good event that day. It was all Philadelphia section professionals. It went two extra holes, and it was won by Jack Conley who was at the time the the pro at Huntington Valley. He beat Pete Oakley on the second extra hole. And Jack went on to become the president of the PGA of America. Pete Oakley went about uh, 20 years later over to the UK and won the British Senior Open in Great Britain. How about that? So that was the first time I did it. Uh, In terms of other golf, on you know, I do inside golf every week here in the Philadelphia area on NBC Sports Philadelphia. And uh, if you haven't seen the show yet, make a promise. That's a plug. Watch. I know. I but, like it. Uh, we do a couple of events. We do the Philadelphia Amateur, uh, and I host that. This year it's going to be at one of my favorite golf courses in Philadelphia, White Marsh Valley. And uh, we also do a big pro event. It's called the Haverford Trust Invitational. It's for Philadelphia area pros. The winner, you ready for this, gets $150,000. It's at Sunnybrook. It's a one-day event, Colin. $150,000 to the winner. Second place prize money, $5,000. You should see what happens when these guys come to 18, knowing they have to make a putt to either win one hundred and fifty dollars or settle for $5,000 for second place. Yes. Yes. Yeah. And there's... A few years ago, it went. there was a seven-hole playoff. It went into the second day. It got dark, and they had to come back and finish up the next day. But I'm the host of that every year, and it's played every year this year. It's also going to be played the day after Memorial Day. Uh, so that's coming up on the calendar, and I always look forward to the Haverford Trust Philadelphia PGA Classic. That's great. That is fantastic. Harris, How's your golf game? You play uh, much? Or- I play once a year, sadly. Once um, a year? That's it. Oh. I, I, I want to play more, but it's hard. It's hard to like power. Well, you're doing about 20 podcasts a week. 
your and then you, uh, training and it's hard to power clean squat deadlift bench press and then go hit 100 balls you're like you can't. You're, yeah. you're, you're just torquing you're constant so i'll hit a shot and my father-in-law he'll be on this episode too he played professional he's played augusta multiple times like he when i play with him he was a, a pro at pine valley very good golfer and wow. what like i can get a, a game going with him he could really good coach and fantastic coach but like I, I i'll get to that point in my life where i'll play more i'd love to get better but i just i something has to give and i i'm not ready i can't give anything yet until i'm retired from playing so right um but i digress well, you know get, getting in golf shape is different than getting in shape to play tight end in the national football yes league, so, it's a little bit you know, different i need a little work. bit a little bit different well hey i had a massage yesterday my How back, you feel? Lower back my lower back ailment has certainly improved <laughs> I'm getting ready. I'm getting ready. So I maybe we ought, to have, we ought to have you and your father-in-law on Inside Golf. We'll do a segment on how difficult the game is for you and how not so difficult the game <laughs> is for your father-in-law. I would, we would absolutely love it. It'd, huh? be, a great, it'd be a great episode. Harris, so uh, you win Champions Dinner. What's your meal? Oh, what would I well, <laughs> You know it's a fantasy if I'm hosting. What would I like to serve up? You know, I have two favorite meals. And uh, I like to cook them myself. Uh, I always love uh, an eight ounce filet, uh, you know, a little seasoning on top, a little blackened seasoning on top. But I'd also put together, well, my first time I was ever in Rome, I got a recipe for a pasta dish, tortellini alla panna, which is basically an Alfredo sauce. And I know how to make it. I don't share the recipe with just anybody. I don't have it written down. It's all up here. But it's, and I add a little peas and bacon to it. In, a, in an Alfredo type sauce, a heavy whipping cream type sauce, and it is mwah, okay. <laughs> so that would be the main course, probably something like a little key lime pie for dessert. Ooh. And we'll open up. You know what I had the other night? At, I think you know this spot, Fred's in Avalon, in Stone Harbor. Yes, Fred's Tavern, iconic bar, right? Yep. How about some fried pickles? Okay, Ooh. so fried pickles, tortellini alla panna. A little key lime pie and um you know you steak and or steak yeah we go pasta steak right what's that that's like uh you turf, got some tr- turf and turf or something i don't know <laughs> oh, i love it all right that's fantastic as we wrap things up uh give me your top five or whatever your favorite golf courses in the philadelphia area well, you know, that does that include uh, Pine Valley and Marion? Yes. Yeah, so South Jersey, like the tri-state area. like Yeah, but those are, you know, they're top, top three courses in the world right there. So you know, how fortunate, as you know, we are in Philly to have so many great, great golf venues. But uh, I'm going to mention a couple maybe that people wouldn't think of necessarily. Um, Union Lake Tarsdale, the old Tarsdale Frankfurt, which the Union Lake of Philadelphia took over a few years back. For me, dollar for dollar is one of the hardest and most uh, challenging golf courses in the area. Uh, it's been around a long time. They had pro events there back in the 40s, and it still can hold its own, I think, as a top five golf course in, in Philadelphia. Philadelphia Cricket Club is one of my all-time, the Wissahickon course at Philadelphia Cricket Club is one of my all-time favorites simply because uh, I had one of my rare eagles on a par four one day over there, and I have a the, one of the my hosts gave me a painting of that hole, which I have hanging in my home. So that emotionally is is one of uh, my favorites. So that's four, you know, Marion Pine Valley, Tarsdale, Philly Cricket, and then there's a lot of courses I could put in there as a tie for fifth. I'm going to do another emotional one. I grew up playing at North Hills Country Club in suburban Philadelphia. My father joined there when I was only eight years old. And that got me involved with the game of golf. So anytime I can play North Hills, it uh, brings back a lot of memories. And it is my attachment to how it all began for me when it comes to golf. How we could do this all day, my friend. I appreciate yeah, we could. you joining we the show. Uh, I look forward to just having you on just to talk life uh, and not just golf. So I hope you have a great time. <laughs> we watching. Really, well, that would really bore. You'd lose a lot of your followers. If, uh, Listen. We I'll tell you what. That doing that, my friend. If yeah, we, I'd love to do it. Yeah. If we could bottle up our commentary and our fun that was not on air 
uh, we would sell it and make millions of dollars. We'd have an absolute blast. We did have a blast. We, yeah, and, and you're going down memory lane there a little bit. You know, how about if we just include, like, our producer at the time, Chet the Jet Zukowski, <laughs> huh? who, holds, who holds the all-time record for fastest departure from a back row seat in a charter jet for a Temple football flight. I mean, how about the way he would hurdle over myself and whoever else was sitting in the row to get right down that aisle get off the plane, get all the equipment, and it'd be sitting on the bus before they'd even put the uh, stairway up on the tarmac. I don't know how oh. he did it. So for those <laughs> know, this, was a, this was a guy, Chet the Jet. He was an operations person at Temple Athletics for years. He, he asked me one day, this is a great, <laughs> <laughs> this guy is the best. He's the nicest guy, but he's just a character. He, he asked me one day to, to, to check class for him. He was getting paid to check class, and he had an umpire. Such a, he was umpiring in South Philly to make so sure had, that the uh, players were going to class. Yeah, yeah. So he's like, "I'm like, I." He's like, "Hey, you're in the class anyways, and there's one across the hall. When you go to the bathroom, can you check across the hall for me too and make sure the guys are in there and text me who's there and who's not there?" He's umpiring a game in South Philly. <laughs> oh yeah, I know. Hey, he did that. He's. I think he's still doing that. Umpire. Ah. He does, how about and if he has double headers, man? You know, beers are on that first round's on jet. <laughs> oh, Har, thank you, buddy. Those are the days. Those were the days, right? Yes, they were. Be well, my and friend. Enjoy the Masters.